increased in our area with the, the use of the Roundup Ready uh, soybean. You'll see soybeans now planted on, on hillsides that, that would have never been cultivated before. Uh, they haven't been plowed, they're, they're, they're side planted in, in either old pasture land or they'll run a, a grass crop or a, a small grain and then they'll kill it and, and plant the soybeans in it. There's a um, spot of soybeans I may have mentioned to you that I've got some land leased to a guy and, and realistically the soybeans are somewhere between four and five feet tall. I noticed um, yesterday that the wind that we've had from, from some of this uh, tropical storm has caused some of those beans to bed down, which is not a good thing. But, uh, but they're so tall they can't hold themselves up. Uh, so it's a, that's a product of plant breeding and, and um, uh, cultural practices that have, have led to that type of uh, high yielding bean. Um, it says worldwide there is about 0.25 hectares of cropland for each person, and that's worldwide. So that's about six tenths of an acre. And he says with, with realistic inputs and yields, there is enough to provide everybody in the world with a vegetarian diet. Um, and when you think about that, that's that's quite a statement with the world's population as it is. But with the projections for world population for reaching we get a lot more people, a lot more people by 2050. And they, the, the reports that I've heard over the last several years is the volume of food that is going to be required to feed those people needs to double. Ooh between now and 2050, just to provide the, the supplement, the substance that's needed to, for those folks. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a concern. Um, quite often, if I remember correctly from the test bank, there's a question in there that talks about where the majority of our fruits and vegetables are grown. Um, but in the United States, 60% of the fruits and vegetables come from two states. And there are two states that have had real weather concerns in the past 15, 18 months. Texas and Florida? Florida and California. California's had major drought and then they've had floods since that time. Uh, they, the drought was so bad about a year ago that they were rationing water to the agricultural production, which would in turn limit the, the acres that they could plant. Uh, and then uh, in the last three or four months, they've had massive rains in those same areas and they flooded. So uh, my point being, we, our, our food supply is, is held in relatively small areas and can be dramatically altered or changed or adversely affected by Mother Nature. So you know, we need to, to constantly be aware of, of food and where it's coming from. <clears throat> There's always a, a, a few folks in the population that are, that are uh, I don't know how to categorize them, but, but they, they're worried about the future. And they'll have be working, having bomb shelters, and then have 15 or 20 years supply of MREs or, or yeah, ready food, to eat. meal ready to eat you know, supplies. I think they're called preppers. Uh, I don't know what they're called. But anyway, that's just a concern for some folks. Um, Skip over a few things here. It says in moist, temperate parts of the world, it is easiest to forget how much water is needed to produce crops. And there's a statement here. It says it will take a ton of water to produce a kilogram of grain. 
So a ton of water is going to be 2,000 pounds. Divide that by eight is going to give you, oh, 250 gallons of water to produce a kilogram of grain. So you know, it's, uh, we, can't, we can't produce this stuff without, uh, without some water. I'm skipping over some of this stuff. Um, it says only about two and a half percent of the cropland is devoted to fiber crops. Um, the market for natural fibers is stagnant or declining. Uh, it's unlikely the production of an area of fiber crops will increase in the near future. There may be an exception to that one. Um, it's come about probably since, it, well, it, the next slide does mention it. Um, I know when, when Dwayne was with us, uh, there was a movement down in Southside, Southwest, excuse me, to begin to grow hemp. And I'm not speaking of the, 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 the hemp crop that contains the hallucinogen. But um, it's a it's another um, cannabis, and it has the potential to grow um, a lot of high valued fiber, which can be used in in clothing and other usage. Um, they were they had a research project. They were growing hemp in that area, and they were harvesting it about this time of year, and then making bricks or building materials out of it. They would process the hemp and, and uh, make it into a, uh, a building material. And it was, was as strong as, as brick or cinder block and a lot lighter and, and easier to use. I haven't, I haven't seen or heard anything about the, the end products of that, but, but there's a lot of work being done with you know, hemp originally what was the primary use of hemp hundreds of years ago? Anybody know? Rope. Rope. It was used to make rope. Exactly. Um, and that was it was very useful. Um, and hemp can be grown in wide areas um, of, of of this country as well as others, but the, there's there's legal ramifications because the, the government wants to heavily regulate what it's grown and they want to make sure that it's not the one that is uh, produces the, the THC of the hallucinogenically. Uh, when we're talking about plant products um, there's quite a discussion about biofuels um, and biofuels are interesting in my eyes um, they are what we call biodiesel or, or there's one one uh, compound and another one would be listed as ethanol um, the federal government mandated several years ago I don't remember exactly when that 10% of all of our gasoline had to be ethanol and that made a major change in um, the corn prices. They put ethanol plants out in the Midwest and in, so to reduce the, the freight of transporting the corn, but they took a fair percentage of the corn that used to be put into animal feeds and ran it through these um, distillation operations to produce ethanol. And um, it had a major effect on the price of corn. A year or two before that, corn was three eighty to four dollars a bushel. And once that uh, went into effect, the, uh, it changed the supply and demand curve, and corn went to eight fifty to nine dollars a bushel. Ooh. That has changed again. It's 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 leveled out, and corn production is it is being uh, is gone to meeting the demand and corn is back down in that four dollar range 
but so much more of it is being produced. Um, so, you know, that's that's one use of a plant product. Um, any of you have any experience with biodiesel? You know what I'm talking about with biodiesel? Um, where people go to like, like you know, yeah, McDonald's and get their grease or oil and use it for fuel and their vehicles. That is is one uh, one type of biodiesel. Um, there was a gentleman down at, in Southwest when we first got this program started that uh, helped us with an alternate energy class, and he had a had a Mercedes, an older model Mercedes, that he had uh, made some modifications to, and, and he and a buddy of his would, would go to the Chinese restaurants and McDonald's and everywhere. And, 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 salvage the oil like you're talking about and they put it in a in a big 275 gallon tote and would let it settle out and then they would pull the 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 better quality product that wasn't as contaminated off the top and they would put it directly into a tank in the trunk of this old mercedes and Actually, my daughter-in-law her parents have a mercedes ironically enough they live up in bassett they're near y'all and they do the same thing yeah uh, he had a pro he, he had a problem with his in that it was cold enough out in southwest it, it worked fine in the summertime but when weather began to, to chill down a little bit he had trouble with starting and getting it to work but he had a, a technician an engineer type fellow that that, that helped him and, and they managed to modify the tank that they were carrying this, this french fry oil in and he would he learned that he needed to to start the car on true diesel and get it up to a running temperature and they had put a, a hose that went from the radiator around through with a coil in that tank to heat the oil and once got up to operating temperature he switched it over to the to the uh, McDonald's product and it would run fine um, we've we had a, a an operation here at Bassett Forks uh, several years ago that was trying to get farmers to grow canola um, any of you know what canola is canola oil it's canola oil but and that's exactly what they were doing, but they were taking the grain, the canola grain itself, which is very much like a turnip seed. It's a product, it's, it's, it's from a, what we call a rape plant, and it would, would, that would be planted about this time of year for a rosette, very much like a, a dandelion uh, plant, and then it would overwinter, and then the spring, that rosette would begin to grow again and would throw a flower shoot, just like if you're familiar with with, with turnip greens or something, and it'll throw a yellow flower stem and produce a seed cluster on that, on that stalk. And then they would um, harvest the canola. Uh, Virginia State was working on uh, some varieties of, of canola to try to increase the, the yield on it because the, the, the average canola production would only be 25 to 30 bushels per acre. And that wasn't cost effective unless we were dealing with four, four fifty dollars diesel. But um, Dr. Harbons was the guy's name, I remember, um, was was a plant breeder down there, and, and I don't know whether he ever got his production up enough. But but since the fuel prices had come back down to you know the two to two fifty range, the the production of Biodiesel by squeezing canola is not cost effective, but it is a viable uh, viable enterprise as a dairy up in uh, the Harrisonburg area, large dairy that, that grows enough canola and they've got the, the land and, and the, the, the equipment needed to harvest the seeds. And they, they store the seed, they put in a mill, and they are in essence growing all of the fuel that is needed to run all of their equipment on this, this large dairy in, in alternate fields from crop fields by using the canola production. Um, 
the, the plant that's here in Bassett Forks now is is doing exactly what what she said with the getting the, uh, the stuff from, from McDonald's and so forth. They actually pay a, a, a firm to collect it and bring it to them. And they filter it out and process it a little bit and then we'll put just a little bit of diesel oil in it to make sure that the, the end product doesn't um, um, set up, co coagulate, whatever you want to call it, uh, to make it more viable for, for the use in, in the uh, in, in vehicles. But it's, uh, they're, they're operating full time. We have used them as a, as a lab uh, exercise for us part of the time. Uh, I haven't been able to catch them out there to talk about it this year, but that's one of my, one of our lab trips will probably be out to the biodiesel plant. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an interesting deal the way they do that. Um, and the vision that they, the guy had when he first started that was to have little biodiesel plants, um, you know, 50 or 60 miles apart throughout the southeastern part of Virginia and, and North Carolina to, to provide uh, fuel for, for tractors and, and, and trucks and things of that type. But with the change in the, in the fuel pricing, it, it hasn't been cost effective. So. Um, there are a lot of other oils that are that are used in in our diet in, for both humans and animals. Um, there's some tropical um, oil crops such as coconut. Uh, then there's oil palms, and and their main usage is in soaps and detergents. Um, then we talked a little bit about the canola. Um, there's also um, soybean um, oil. And it's used in the manufacture of lubricants and plastics. Uh, corn oil is another one. Peanut oil. Um, if you go into uh, Chick Fil A, they'll say they'll have a, a, a clause on their door that, you know, if you have an allergy to peanuts, that that their French fries are fried in peanut oil. So they're, they're trying to avoid any complication with anybody that has potential peanut allergies. But but plant products are used for all of these different different types of oils and production. Um, skipping over a little bit of your stuff here that's um, there have been a history of a lot of of plant products used as medicines. Um, and the term that's used is ethnobotany, and that's a study of plants used by indigenous cultures and preservations of, of knowledge. And it has become an important branch of plant science. Can anybody give me an example of a plant product that's used as a medicine? Marijuana. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about something that's a little more readily available. Aloe. Aloe is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elderberry. Um, elderberry, yep. Yeah. This one is it's been in existence for a long time. It's the product of a of um, the bark on a willow tree. Is that aspirin? That's aspirin. Salicylic acid is aspirin. And it's derived from the bark of a willow tree. <laughs> so, you know, if you get a throbbing headache and you don't have an aspirin, you go chew on a willow limb, I guess. I don't know. But they, um, they are, um, aspirin is, is, has been a, a real savior to a lot of folks. Um, some plant products provide um, pleasure with no nutritional benefit. And, and this one is, is, the one I'm speaking of is very prevalent across the south side of Virginia. Uh, it's called... Um, marijuana? Uh, well, <laughs> marijuana's probably, it always, that always comes up in discussions we have. But, but I was talking about tobacco at that time. Oh, yeah. 
Um, I knew, but that joke was too easy. I couldn't let it go. <laughs> I don't blame you. I sort of fed you for that. That's good. Um, but tobacco is one that has been used for many years. Uh, a lot of work being done now with tobacco um, to try to find medicinal uses of it. I think the Institute in Danville and the some folks in Blackstone are, are doing some work with with uh, specific applications of tobacco products with the genetics of them trying to have them uh, find a more beneficial use. Um, alcohol is is a plant product in every in every sense. Uh, you know your all of your it, now uh, one of the most uh, active uh, entrepreneurial opportunities is craft brewing, and, and those craft breweries are popping up around a lot of areas. We don't have one right here in Martinsville. Any any of them down south side, Tom, that you're aware of? There's one in uh, Clarksville. Is there? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> but if you're familiar with the processes that they use there, they start that with a, a plant product. Um, I've been dealing with wine grapes for the last two or three weeks and got another two or three weeks of those, but there again, that's that's a plant product that's for, used to produce a wine, and that's a product of, uh, through fermentation. It's, it's a little different than, than the beer manufacturing, and quite different than, than the alcohol through whiskey type production. But the area uh, around where we reside here in Patrick Henry has always had the reputation of a lot of um, Illicit, illicit stills and alcohol production. Yes. Uh, Franklin County has that reputation of being probably the, the, the moonshine capital of the world. Pennsylvania County too. Pennsylvania County too. Um, there was uh, a TV show that, that um, started, I guess, down in, in Franklin County. They did it over in Gallons too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and, and uh, it's it's regardless of how you feel about it, it's it's it is a um, a, a plant product, and that's that's all I'm concerned about with this. Um, Carol, or some of them, you said you had coffee for breakfast. That's a plant product. You had tea. That's a plant product. Um, the sugar cane, the sugar that you use to put in your coffee or your tea. Is a plant product, whether it comes from sugar cane or sugar beets. Um, then the, the the corn has a byproduct of corn syrup. There again, that's another plant product. So, you know, we are um, directly affected by most everything we do in some way or another is a plant product. Um, the, the desk that you're sitting in, if they're not a wooden desk, they're a plastic or, or product that that has the oils and so forth derived from it that more than likely is a plant product. Oh, is everybody studying? Uh, then as we you know deviate a little bit, all of our horticultural crops, our landscapes and things of that type are again ornamental plants. You, I had a instructor when I was at Tech that had a pet peeve about plastic flowers. That he he would he would go off when when anybody would talk about a, a permanent arrangement of flowers that, that were that he picked up at Roses or Walmart that were plastic. He he would he would he would go off on them about that. But otherwise, you know, majority of our landscape products are, are, are plant derived. And, yeah, what happened to the stuff being made of trees? I'm tired of the faux wood that has, what is it called? Veneer? Underneath it. It's or chipcore? Yeah, like a plant board as a wall. Or a chipcore or OSB or something. Yeah, what about it? 
tired of it. That's what they have for sale. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it and sucks. I agree. Everything else is like antiques. But, but it's should... made and it's extremely expensive. Yeah. Why can't we just... Well, because the chip core is a whole lot cheaper. They take well, yeah. yeah, they take leftover, just wood scrap stuff, grind it up to a pulp, and put in glue and whatever, mash it out and pressurize it and that kind of stuff. And it doesn't have the structural integrity, but yeah. Um, I mean, if you want, if you want some strength, get some actual plywood. Plywood, you know, and you know, you can get like a, would you go to get oak plywood or something like that? It still is going to be veneer, but. At least it'll hold a screw. But yeah, it's that's the way furniture is, unless we want to pay a whole lot more. Yeah, like that's glued on there. You get the piece off, so it'll be yeah. like hanging off. Because basically, it's what they do off. is, you know how you peel a uh, peel an apple. <laughs> yeah. That's more or less what they do with the tree is they peel it off to get those sheets, and that's where that veneer is. Because oh, so I mean, there's you, you got a that, that desk is three feet wide. Mm -hmm. you know, there's not very many trees out there that are going to be three feet wide. So that's why it's got to be rolled, pressed, a bunch of stuff has to happen to it in order to actually get any kind of wood product of that size, unless we have a whole freight car load of redwood trees. So that's why the bulk of your furniture is going to end up having something that's been processed underneath and they roll out the veneer and glue it on top. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, but then if you you look at your antiques, it's a series of boards that are like glued together, pegged together, and that kind of stuff. It's not a solid surface. Your dining room table is going to be a series of boards that may be six, eight, ten inches long or wide, a bunch of them attached together. It's not going to be a one sheet. Even antique stuff? Yes, even antique stuff. Well, I mean, because you think about, like I said, the size of your dining room table is four feet wide. How many four foot wide trees are there? Yeah, I mean they they sit there they drill holes and they use pegs and that kind of stuff pegs and glue and glue them together and clamp them together and that kind of thing. But yeah. So that's just do it yourself. Well, you're still gonna end up doing if you do it yourself. You're still gonna be doing it like the old way, boards and pegs and glue and yeah. Yes. Not that I was trying to hijack your class there, John, but. Oh, you're 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 fine. But what what she is speaking of. Even the press board, the particle board, is a plant product because it's sawdust. Yes. Or, you know, it's it's still a plant product. It may not be the most desirable, but cost-wise and, and so forth, it it does fill a niche. It's heavy as lead. It's hard to manage and not very durable. But it is, it is a, a as we talk about this, a plant product. And Tom's exactly right. You know, the... the, the the era of the old chestnut trees that were four feet across is is gone, and we just don't have that type of timber anymore. What is it? Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, again, an extra day. As we as we talk about plant production, we've got um, other facilities other than just you know field grown stuff. We've got a lot of uh, greenhouses and uh, artificial growing situations that that add to our um, that provides plants for us, whether it be a food plant or or, or ornamental plants. So uh, a lot of that is is done and, and available for us. Um, and it says that ornamental crops are the most labor-intensive crop, account for nearly 20% of the U.S. agricultural labor crop cost. Um, they have extensive use of fertilizers, pesticides, and uh, some of them add a lot to our diet in form of many materials for manufacturing and pharmaceuticals and perfumes. And we just finished chapter three. So... <clears throat> That's all I had hoped to do today, and you guys have another academic exercise that you're facing, so I'll shut up and let you uh, begin to gather your thoughts for that. Thank you. If you have any questions or need me, let me know. I'll try to respond. I have managed to grade and record everything that I have gotten 
that um, I could identify. There's still a couple of papers that I, I wasn't able to identify, and a couple of folks' stuff went in on a junk file um, to my email, but I was able to salvage those yesterday. So I've, if check for me and make sure that everything you've turned in is accounted for. If not, resend it to me, and I'll, I'll make, make corrections, okay? Good luck on the test. Yeah, and John, I sent you an email about the class schedule thing, and I'll try to send okay. you on the Zoom thing a little bit later. That's fine. That's just fine. 